Hello and welcome back to Park Fermi Parley with Kieran Downey. We're here right after the Dutch GP to break down everything that happened from Lando Norris's second win. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I got it wrong. My prediction of a Max Verstappen masterclass this weekend did not come to fruition and I am glad by it. I will say that. I am glad by it because Lando got his second win. Lando got his second win. So let's jump right in. Zandvoort, surprised that there was no yellow flags, no safety cars, and all 20 drivers finished the race. I genuinely thought we'd come out of that race with not the entire grid having finished and at least, at minimum, a yellow flag. But apparently not. Apparently all the teams and all the drivers were on their best behaviours, except for the first driver that we're going to talk about, who was definitely up to his old tricks. So let's get right into it, shall we? With Kevin Magnussen, who qualified 15th, started from the pit lane and finished P18. Now Kevin started from the pit lane because the team broke Park Fermi to give him, I think it was a new energy store and new control electronics, which one, broke Park Fermi, two, was also above his allowance for both of those parts. So he was shipped off to the pit lane to start. I thought actually, in fact, actually, no, not for our, not for Magnussen, because Magnussen was never really kicking about, was he? He was always the, between the two Haas drivers, he was the Haas that was further to the back. He had a huge bit of a lockup coming into turn one and just went clean off into the gravel. So that put him at a massive disadvantage. He's already got a disadvantage starting from the pits and here you are carrying too much speed into turn one and just off he went. So not great for Magnussen. He, as I said, was up to his old tricks. There was a phenomenal bit of racing where there was like five cars coming out of the final corner down the pit straight and they were all just kind of battling. And Alex Albon had come over the radio, and I know obviously the radio messages are not timed to exactly what we're seeing on track. And the radio message had come through being like, well, that's just dangerous. And I was like, what are you talking about, Alex? What are you talking about? Because all I'm seeing here is just some good racing five car racing like this is the stuff we dream of in F1 but turns out what he was actually talking about was Kevin Magnussen who lost four positions in that fight when what he was actually trying to do was slow down the pack for Nico Hülkenberg. Yep he was up to his old tricks again uh, very reminiscent of Jeddah, very reminiscent of Miami pretty much reminiscent of quite a few races this year where Magnussen has played a team game to benefit Nico Hülkenberg. It didn't benefit Hülkenberg, obviously he finished P11th, but, but basically what happened was Albon was having a little bit of a go at Magnussen and coming out of turn 13, a very high speed corner, Magnussen just put his foot on the brakes, slowed the car right down, which won, I agree with you, Alex Albon, is very dangerous. And two, as I said, cost him dearly because he lost not one, but four positions. So, oh well, what a shame, Magnussen. But apart from being a little bit of a twat, we didn't actually see Magnussen at all for the rest of the race. I'm not going to lie, I don't think I'm going to miss K-Mag when he leaves at the end of the year. But I am kind of glad that his, uh, his tricks didn't pay off this time and... Uh, screwed himself over. So, well done, K-Mag. And moving on to his teammate, Nico Hulkenberg. Hulkenberg, who qualified P14, started P12, finished P11. Now, obviously, as I said, Magnussen's efforts were kind of for nothing. Not only did he lose positions himself, Hulkenberg didn't actually finish within the points. He was just close. Just close. But... What can you do? Hülkenberg was actually one of the many drivers who got lapped by the front runners. So not a great, oh, it's so close. I can't even say it's not great because he obviously has benefited before the race even began with Alex Albon's disqualification 
and Lewis Hamilton's grid penalty. That's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. We did get some fantastic racing between Hamilton and Nico Hülkenberg. Nico just was not for letting Hamilton pass and it took Hamilton and it really hindered Hamilton. It took Hamilton a long time to get past Hülkenberg and it was just nice to see. Not nice to see a Lewis Hamilton having to fight a Haas but nice to see Hülkenberg doing some pretty good defending. I have to say actually at one point both Haas drivers were running pretty solid. I think a P10 and P11 and I was like, okay, this is quite nice for the boys. Yeah, let's, I was getting into it. And then I basically I blinked and they were like down the back of the grid. Not much else really to say about the Haas boys. A decent weekend actually from Hülkenberg. A nice recovery from a poor qualifying. And uh, Kevin Magnussen actually went backwards. Like K-Mag actually went backwards. How has he started? And for K-Mag... I mean, he started from the pit lane and finished P18. Dismal race, actually, from K-Mag. Absolutely dismal. Let's move on to another two drivers that had very dismal races. Zhou Guan Yu and Valtteri Bottas. So, Zhou Guan Yu qualified P19, started the race P17, finished P20. Valtteri Bottas qualified P18, started P16, finished P19. I really tried. I really, really tried my hardest to pay some attention to the Cybers, but it's just so hard. It's so difficult. They're never shown on the broadcast. So I was just every so often making sure I was keeping an eye on the timing tower to see where about they were. And I don't know why I bothered. Zhou Guan Yu, I don't think, was any higher than P17 for the entire race. I can't even say it was dismal to watch because I didn't actually see him at all. Valtteri Bottas on one hand, I actually have two bullet points written in my notes for Valtteri Bottas because I was watching the, the drama unfold from the front, obviously the, the Leclerc, the Norris, the Hamilton of it all. And then was like looking at the timing tower and I let me, hold on, let me find it. On lap five, when he got up to P14, and I was like, all right, P14. Then I went and paid some attention to something else. And then I checked back again, and he was on lap 15, P13. And I was like, my God, imagine if Valtteri Bottas finishes around P10. That would be wild. And then I was obviously focusing on other stuff. And when I looked back at the timing tower, they were P 19 and P20. What's the point of them even racing anymore? Like, in all seriousness, what is the actual point of Valtteri and Joe going out and trying for anything anymore? I really just don't understand. What has Cyber done with that car? As I said, when we did our mid-season driver ratings, when we were talking about Joe Guan Yu, he finished in 11th in Bahrain. And now it's P20 nearly every single day. Like, what's what's the point anymore? What's the point? I'm just, I'm so bored. I'm so over it. I'm going to move on to Daniel Ricciardo, who qualified 15th, started 13th, finished 12th. Ricciardo is one of the drivers that has fallen to a fate where you never really see them, to be honest. It's very like the Joe Grand News of the world the Yuki Tsunoda's, those back markers that you just don't see because we're so focused on an incredible midfield fight, to be fair, that I think Ricardo might have been part of, but just was kind of nondescript this weekend. Fantastic that he's finished P12. And, you know, I don't know what happened with Yuki Tsunoda but it is good to see that Daniel is finishing ahead of his teammate. That's the kind of results that they're going to want. But the results, to be fair, should be that he's finishing in the points. I don't really know what's happened to VCAR recently. They've kind of fallen off, haven't they? There was a few points where you could see Daniel in a, in a nice little couple of fights. But promising that he's finishing close to P10, but just not good enough. Yuki Tsunoda, who qualified 13th, started 11th, finished 17th. Was there like a bad pit stop or something that just 
didn't work for Yuki? Like, why is he finishing so far back? Like, I don't know what happened to Yuki at all. I was watching the broadcast, and then I just happened to look to the side, and he was, like, way down down the bottom. Like, way down the bottom. And was fighting Logan Sargent. And he couldn't get past Logan. He actually couldn't get past the Williams of Logan Sargent. That car was pretty much paper mache back together, and he couldn't get past it. Like, what was going on for Yuki? Just absolutely terrible. Terrible, terrible weekend for Yuki Tsunoda and kind of worrying actually. All right, moving on to Logan Sargent who didn't qualify, started the race 18th and finished 16th. Considering Logan Sargent crashed, pretty much totaled his car, destroyed it, completely destroyed it to the point that it caught fire. I'm going to say an all right weekend for an all right race for Logan Sargent. He didn't qualify. He managed to gain some places he didn't crash again was only two places behind his teammate like not a bad performance to be fair for logan Sargent. i mean at this point really logan Sargent just needs to not put pressure on himself i imagine there is still pressure on him to do the best he can if i was logan Sargent right now i would be Focus on figuring out what I'm going to do next year. He's not going to be, I think it's curtains on his F1 career. One, I don't think he's got enough time left to try and convince a team to give him a drive. He has been asked about a reserve driver situation, I think, or like a testing driver, I think, for Williams uh, and by the media. And he was like, nothing's been said yet. Um, there is rumours of a potential move to IndyCar, which I think he should do. But if I was Logan Sargent, I'd be straight up just chilling, to be honest with you. Like, as I said, I know there's pressure and I know as F1 drivers, they want to constantly be doing the best. But I'd be taking the pressure off myself completely. The Williams is not a great car. Logan, just honestly, I'd just not be getting myself worked up about anything, to be honest with you. And I'd be taking it a little bit easier on myself. Uh, obviously, that mistake that happened in FP3 was completely his own fault. For whatever reason, he decided to drive onto the grass, which is a rogue choice at the best of times, but especially when it's wet and you're at Zandvoort. But yeah, I would just, I would for Logan, I just wouldn't let the, I wouldn't sweat about it. It's fair about it, babes. You know, just enjoy the final few races of your F1 career because I can't imagine he's going to get signed at V-Carb. I can't imagine he's going to go to Cyber. I imagine that Cyber seat's now Valtteri Bottas since they couldn't convince Carlos. That's all I have to say for Logan Sargent. His teammate, Alex Albon, start, uh, qualified 8th, started 19th, finished 14th. Mega drive, to be fair, from Alex Albon to get from 19th to 14th he obviously took a disqualification from qualifying because the floor of his car was out with the regulations set by the FIA so clear disqualification um, I think James Files said it was like you know you could take a bit of sandpaper and rub it and that would be sufficient enough for the FIA but um yeah decent racing as I said he was part of that lovely five car battle that was a delight to watch I want more of that please he then did fall back quite a little bit I think his tires seemed to be doing well on a hard tire and I think everyone that put the hard tires on did a very good job up until about lap 30 on a hard tire once you sort of hit lap 30 on your hard tires they just they pieced out they were like see ya bye and as i said it is a shame because he was looking bloody mighty on those hard tires he was picking up position after position after position and i think it was maybe lap 39 lap 40 maybe he was sitting p11 and i was like come on alex please score a point and then the tires failed him and to be fair, finishing P14 when you've started P19 is not the worst, especially around Zandvoort, especially when it's really hard to overtake. So, well done, Alex, for, for that. All right, moving on to Pierre Gasly, who qualified 10th, started 9th, finished 9th. 
I'm not going to lie, great weekend for Pierre Gasly. Absolutely great weekend. He was having some very good fights. He had a brilliant little scrap with Carlos Sainz at one point. He had another amazing little scrap with Lewis Hamilton. He managed to hold Hamilton off pretty decently. And it was just so nice to see him in these points positions fighting. Like, this is what I need from Alpine. Thank you. Thank you. My God, it's been a long, slow, miserable travel to get here. I don't think that's the right analogy I'm looking for, but it was actually really nice to see Pierre Gasly fighting for points. And yeah, it was just really good. Just great racing from Gasly this weekend. I was very pleasantly surprised. I don't know why I'm so pleasantly surprised, because we know he is actually a good racer. But I was just surprised when I was like, yeah, and I was cheering him on. I was like, go Gasly. And then I was realizing he was fighting Hamilton and I was like, ooh, Hamilton. One thing that wasn't so great for Gasly, he did actually at one point get noted for an unsafe release where he'd pitted, they'd done the work and somebody at the front, this front side of the car, I don't know whether, he must have been finished working because the car was lowered to the ground, but his hands were still close to that car and Gasly just took off and the guy had to like pull his hands away quickly. And I didn't notice it at the time because I couldn't see it, but there was a lot of talk that maybe he he had been released before the light had been like gone green, like he'd went before the light had gone green, but the stewards didn't seem to think so and there was no further action taken against him for said unsafe release. But that's quite a few times this has happened now with Alpine where they've just had a little bit of a, oh, airy scary moment. He's obviously got Jack Doohan coming in alongside him next year and he's got a new team principal, Oliver Oakes, who seems to have a solid head on him. That's that's very positive um, and I'm hoping that Alpine will only be on the up. Moving on to the worst of the two Alpines this weekend and Esteban Ocon who qualified 17th, finished 15th. I have no notes on Ocon at all to be honest. He, I know in qualifying, was it qualifying? I think it was qualifying when he was punted out. He was saying that, you know, the car felt like a disaster and I just don't think he really got to grips with it, to be honest. Um, I don't think I seen him once. He just seemed to be, he was obviously there. He was obviously racing, but I can't actually say much about Esteban Ocon because he was just never really shown on screen. So I've got no idea whether he had a decent drive or not. I just know that he started 17th and he finished 15th. So, you know, well done. You you gained... Oh, wait, where did he finish? Finished 15th. Yeah, sorry. I've just completely mucked that up. Esteban Ocon qualified 17th, started 15th, finished 15th. So he finished where he started. Lovely weekend from Esteban Ocon. Well done, mate. All right, next up, Fernando Alonso, who qualified 7th, finished 10th. Uh, didn't have a great start. To be honest, he uh, was quickly overtaken by Gasly, who managed to get the jump on both the uh, the Aston Martins into turn one. I'm not going to lie, I'm a little bit surprised that he finished in the points. It didn't really seem like he would at one point, and I'm glad he's finished ahead of Stroll. That's where he should be finishing. But yeah, just obviously not a great weekend for Alonso. Stroll did qualified ninth, started eighth, finished 13th. Uh, Stroll obviously did take a five second penalty for speeding in the pit lanes. Again, it's just that he went into the pits with way too much speed, did not slow his car down at all. So that is a clear cut penalty. Not a furiously impressive drive by either of them to be honest with you um he did Alonso was in a couple of decent scraps but nothing to, I would say for both of the drivers nothing to write home about I'm just glad that Alonso's got a point yeah I don't really have much to say about the the Aston Martin boys just not their weekend okay moving on to Oscar Piastri who qualified third finished fourth oh what a shame what a shame. I feel for Oscar. Podium was so on the cards. But one, bad start. Both him and Norris, I think they both had some wheel spin. He lost a position at the start of the race. He was then at one point holding off Charles Leclerc very well. 
he was, you know, not letting Leclerc pass him. And it was, you know, some great defending on his part. And then he got undercut. He got undercut by Charles Leclerc. And he just couldn't get back past couldn't get back past him. The McLaren obviously pitted Lando first. They left Oscar out a little bit. And when he finally did pit, he had, I think, like a six lap advantage on, I think, Russell and a couple of extra laps on top of that for Charles Leclerc. And he was flying at one point. And I was like, okay, here we go. He's going to be able to get past George Russell, which he did. And he sailed past George. He made it look so easy getting past Russell. But managed to get past Russell and then I was like cool not that I want him to because I would love Charles Leclerc to finish on a podium which he did but he's gonna then just get past Leclerc you know a few more turns around the sun he's gonna get lovely bit of DRS coming out the final corner and he's just gonna sail down that pit straight make the move going into turn one and then he's gonna be able to hunt down Verstappen and I genuinely thought we were in for a McLaren 1-2 this weekend but Oscar just couldn't get past Leclerc. And then at one point I thought, okay, is he maybe just preserving tyres? Is that what we're doing? Like, are we, we've done a little bit of a battle with Leclerc. We can't get it. Am I then going to, is Oscar then preserving his tyres until Leclerc's fall off a cliff? And then he'll get the switch done. And then, or if Leclerc has to pit again, um, which quite a few of the drivers did pit again to stick on, a soft or a, another medium because the hards as I said just didn't work after about 30 laps and then he could go and attack attack Verstappen but no just wasn't wasn't there and when he came out the pits as I said he was flying he was one second he was lapping one second faster than Russell Leclerc and Verstappen and could only get past Russell. He did obviously get hampered a little bit when him and Leclerc started fighting through the, the back marker traffic and it only meant that Verstappen was able to just extend a little bit. It did mean that they dropped back from Verstappen whilst they were trying to wade their way through the traffic. But yeah, just not a fantastic race for Oscar. I don't know what was going on that he just couldn't get past Leclerc. I, I really don't. And, you know, with Lando winning... Lando has now closed his gap a little bit to Verstappen by a couple of points. It really needs Oscar to be right there with Lando as a 1-2 so that Lando can fully just start chipping away at that advantage that Max has, which is now... Oh, let me see. I think F1 actually just put up a, a graphic. Should we actually get into Lando Norris, actually? Lando Norris qualified first, finished first. My God, did I think he wasn't going to win this race? Did I think he'd actually thrown away another race win? I did, yes. Uh, terrible start, again. He hit the clutch and just wheel spin. And they just allowed Verstappen just to sail on past him before turn one even approached. And it's not that long a run. However, Lando seems to have, you know, taken, I think, everything from the past few races and gone on summer break and just been like, I need to figure out what I need to work on here. And he's worked on it because he just kept his cool, kept his cool, kept his calm, kept racing. Never let Max get too far out of sight. And at one point it was like a, a two second gap and I was like, oh, here we go. Max Verstappen is just going to sail away into the sunset. But no, no, no. Lando Norris managed to keep on him. Max could not shake Lando, and that was beautiful. And Lando just kept it to him, kept the fight at him, and within a few few laps, managed to, to take the lead back. Norris had phenomenal pace on those starting mediums, and they asked him, they were like, right, who do you think we're racing? And Lando was like, well, whoever, I'm guessing the guy in front. And they're like, okay, and he's like, I feel good, I feel good in the tyres, and you know, I feel like I've got good pace. And they're like, right, perfect, go for it. Like, just go. And by lap 18, he'd got the job done. He took back the lead of the race from Max. And then I got a bit worried because he wasn't breaking away like I needed him to. He couldn't, he then couldn't shake Max. And I was like, well, there's a little switcheroo here, isn't there? And then he managed to just break the DRS to Max. Managed to just shake that off and then just started extending and extending and extending and I was like 
Hallelujah. Here we go. He was complaining about his brakes at one point, and then it turned out that he'd actually just gotten a bit of a rogue wind. I think it was at turn 10 that was affecting quite a few of the drivers. So thankfully that didn't turn into anything. Red Bull then decided they were going to pit Max. Lando then pitted to cover Max, and they stuck on a, that hard tyre for him, and just off he went. Sailed. Sailed to an absolute incredible margin. Took that win with 22.8 seconds to max. That is Max and Red Bull-esque 2023 style, you know, I'm going to win this race and I'm going to win this race. And it doesn't even matter. You might as well all go home because I'm winning this with 20 seconds. That was old school 2023 Max and Red Bull. But from what I can see, the last time Max won with an over 20 second, and it was about 22.4 second gap, was Bahrain. Norris winning with a 20 second, 22 point, nearly 23 second lead. That is insane. That is literally statement made. And he was just making it seem so easy. He was just there, cruising along. And then I was like, okay, like, Stop showing off, Lando. And then on the last lap, the final last lap, what did he go and do? Sets the fastest lap. On old hard tires, sets the fastest lap. Yeah, I actually think he only had one stop and then manages to pump in the fastest lap at the end. Like, Lando Norris, like what the actual hell? That, it just shows that that McLaren is an actual rocket ship this year like they have created an actual machine on track and now it's just great to see it being utilized as it should be utilized but can I just say this is it it's game on now Lando lost the lead regained the lead won with a 22.8 second gap and got fastest lap. McLaren genuinely have a chance here at both the drivers and constructors championships and all they need to do is just be consistent every week. If Lando and McLaren can keep this kind of performance up, they've got both championships in the bag. In the bag. What is going on? Why have I suddenly become straight? But, like, they've got it in the bag. Next up, Carlos Sainz, who qualified 11th, started 10th, finished 5th. Great racing from Sainz, great racing from both Ferraris, and it's actually a little bit worrying, and I'll come on to that in a second. Sainz was making some great moves. He had a beautiful move on the outside of Alonso round turn one. That was stunning. As I said, he had some lovely fighting with Gasly, which was really nice to see. And yeah, he just seemed to be, he just seemed to be quietly there, did, uh, did Sainz. He was just kind of making moves stealthily and was never really showing that much. But he had a great race, like, Getting from what, P, what did I say? Five places, five places. Well done, my man. Well done, Carlos. Like, solid weekend from him. Charles Leclerc as well, qualified P6, finished P3. The fact that Charles Leclerc, and to that effect, Carlos Sainz, the fact that Carlos Sainz managed to gain five places in that Ferrari, the fact that Charles Leclerc managed to get a P3 podium and hold off Oscar Piastri in that Ferrari, which, to be honest with you, has been behaving more like a tractor recently. Well, that is the news of the day to me. I actually voted Charles Leclerc driver of the day. I did. I thought he was phenomenal out there. He was brilliant. Like, the race that that man was putting in, I don't know where they found the pace. I generally don't know where they found the pace. I'm not complaining. Not complaining, but I don't know where it came from because they were terrible in practice terrible in qualifying. Like they had an abysmal qualifying. Carlos Sainz, the fact that Carlos Sainz started in a terrible FP1 because of the rain, didn't really run an FP2 because he had a gearbox issue, didn't really run an FP3 because Logan Sargent crashed and 40 minutes of the session was red flagged. Terrible qualifying and then has gone and got P5. Like insane work from both those boys and I generally thought Charles Leclerc was maybe on for a P4 maximum absolutely maximum but my god he did some brilliant racing as i said ferrari made all the right calls they pitted him early he managed to get the undercut done on piastri and then he was just solidly driving solid clean good driving and it was wild to see that this car that is not a good car at the moment 
was lapping to the pace of maybe not Lando Norris, but Oscar Piastri and Max Verstappen. Like he was actually lapping quicker than Max because he was slowly beginning to chip away at that at that gap that um, Verstappen had managed to get himself. They did obviously drop off. Him and Oscar dropped off a little bit as they were kind of fighting and then fighting to get through the traffic. They dropped from behind uh, Verstappen. But, you know, he was slowly beginning to pick it back. And fantastic result from, from both Ferrari boys. Well done. What is worrying, going back to my uh, earlier comment, is both the drivers don't know why. Nobody can genuinely tell us why the Ferrari seems to have been fast. And everyone outside that team, fans, commentators, you know, whatever it is, outside of the Ferrari team, all of us are like, oh, wonder where that came from. I wonder why. Turns out inside the garage, Ferrari are going, oh, where did that come from? I wonder why. They have literally got all the data in front of them and they don't even understand where that came from. A little bit worrying, but I'll take it. And moving on to the Mercedes boys and Lewis Hamilton qualified 12th, started 14th, finished 8th. Another driver that was just picking off drivers. He was just making moves, just pew, 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 pew. Here, there, like just every couple of laps, he was just picking another one off. I had a love you, and I love you, and I love you. It was lovely to watch. Absolutely lovely to watch. He started on a soft tire and went 23 laps. 23 laps on a soft tire. My God, that's amazing. He did pit to get fastest lap. He'd managed to sort of put enough pace. He managed to put enough of a gap between him and I think it was Perez behind him that he had essentially got three pit stop. So he pitted to stick on the softs. And he was going for the fastest lap point. And he did it. And... He radioed into the, the pit wall and he was like, did I get it? And they were like, you got it. And he was like, you sure? Because I can go again. And they were like, nah, you're grand. And then now you know where Lando Norris sticks it in on the final lap. I'd be pissed if I was Hamilton, to be fair. But solid recovery from a terrible weekend, I would say, from Mercedes. And everyone agrees that they just weren't on good form this weekend. Total Wolf said the same. Lewis Hamilton says the same. And so does his teammate, George Russell who qualified fourth, finished seventh. It just kind of fell apart for them, didn't it? They just couldn't, you just couldn't keep it, couldn't keep the cars behind him, behind him. Um, couldn't keep Leclerc behind him, couldn't keep Piastri behind him. Couldn't think of the driver I was after there. Yeah, just couldn't keep the drivers behind him. And I, I don't know what happened to Mercedes this weekend. As I said, I solidly put them in to be in f contention for pole, to be in contention with a win, and they just weren't there. And they've said it. They were like, Lewis Hamilton actually said, he was like, I'd quite like it to rain again because we were quite good in the rain. Abysmal weekend. Hopefully they can bounce back because they were looking good. And I was, we were all so happy. Everyone, we were all so happy being like, oh, thank God. Mercedes has finally found its form again and here we go. And then just, hopefully it's a blip. Hopefully it is a blip of a weekend um, because I was enjoying a Mercedes renaissance. All right, Sergio Perez qualified fifth, finished sixth. Not really the weekend for Perez either. Couldn't really make any moves. Was losing positions. Um, it's a wonder that he actually managed to finish P6, to be completely honest. And was actually really nowhere. Have I got any notes for Perez? Perez putting up a good fight. Don't know when, can't remember it, but apparently he was putting up a good fight. Was that maybe with Signs? It was with Signs. Him and Signs were having a good argument. And he was, you know, fighting with Signs and Signs, you know, he was managing to defend Signs quite well. And Signs was attack and attack and attack. And Signs did obviously get the job done, but yeah, not really much else to say for Perez. Do you know what you would think? If you were to look at the positions only, P20 to P1, and you looked at it and you went, all right, Lando Norris got P1. Max Verstappen got P2. Perez isn't too far behind him in P6 compared to when he's been sat P17 for a few races. If you were to look at that, you'd go, ah, oh, Perez is back. Here we go. No, you'd be mistaken. Perez finished 16 seconds behind Verstappen. That's nuts. Like the gap between Leclerc, Leclerc and Carlos, what was that gap? 
The gap between Leclerc and Sainz was 6.6 .6 seconds. How are you 16 seconds behind Verstappen? Like, the gap between him and Sainz, he was 7 seconds behind Sainz. Like, Sergio, what the hell is going on? He was just kind of in his own little... His own little bubble, wouldn't he? It's going to want to get better than that because I'm going to say that even that P6, you're 16 seconds behind your teammate. I would say that's not enough to save you. All right, and finally, Max Verstappen, who qualified second, finished second. Verstappen had a very good start. I will say that is one thing about Verstappen. He's a very good Formula One driver when it comes to starting races. He's a very good Formula One driver, but his starts are usually chef's kiss. He's not comfortable in that car though. He was complaining all throughout it. He was complaining about the tires. He was complaining about the grip. He was complaining about pretty much the entire thing. So there's something going on in that car. There has to be something going on in it that's not causing him to be, to, to enjoy it that much. To, to, he's obviously not comfortable and I can't put out what it is. And obviously we came into this year and knew he was given it all. Well, you know, when we were thinking about the 2024 car, we realized that a lot of the other teams would look at our 2023 car and basically copy that, the way it looks and all that kind of stuff. So we decided that rather than do an evolution of the 2023 car, we would basically do something very different for 2024. Has that bitten them in the ass? Like, has that come back to bite them and haunt them when McLaren, who is kind of copied and looks like the, the RB19, because now McLaren are fast and have been fast since just before Miami. Lando's been pretty quick. That McLaren's been pretty quick for the majority of the year and hasn't really seemed to have had the same issues as uh, Max and his Red Bull. So... There's obviously something there, and oh how the tides have turned, that Max Verstappen is on the receiving end of finishing P2, and the winner being 20 odd seconds down the road. It's very interesting, it's very, very interesting. He's obviously saying, he's like, listen, we're just not quick enough, and I don't think they're going to be, I think there, oh, there's some mega tracks coming up that are going to be a struggle, I think, for the Red Bull, to be honest with you. Let's see what we got coming up. Um, Monza could be a bit of a struggle. Azerbaijan could be a bit of a struggle. Singapore could be a bit of a struggle. Brazil, I think, could be a struggle for them. Vegas, I think, could be a struggle for them. That's pure vibes, by the way, um, what I'm going off, but that's who I think things might go. But as I said... Brilliant job from Lando Norris, securing a, his second win. That's two wins in his first winning year, if that makes any sense. Um, and his first win that is purely like, feels like it's just on racing. It's not like the safety car and, oh, the safety car scooped up Max by accident and it shouldn't have scooped up Max. It should have scooped up Lando, like all this chat. It's just solid racing. Solid racing got Lando Norris that win. Um, so yeah, a very enjoyable Grand Prix and very much looking forward to Monza next week. One of my favourites. I love Monza. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And to my knowledge, Haas will be allowed to race in Monza because I believe they have paid their debts and they will be allowed to leave the Netherlands. So thank God for that. But that is everything from us. We hope you enjoyed the Grand Prix, the Dutch Grand Prix. I certainly enjoyed it. But as I said, enjoy. But as I said, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Love you. Bye.